off our guest lecture series today with a basic, basic intro to neuroscience. Um, uh, we, we have asked Dr. Robin Duncan to come. She is an actual UCSC lecturer and she received her PhD in ecology and evolutionary bio from UCSC as well. So some of you may have seen her in intro to bio classes, but um, if this, if this like reading that you're supposed to do beforehand went over your head, like ask questions during this lecture, like, you know, we get it, you guys aren't all bio majors, but um, yeah, so here she is. <laughs> So for example, 
a sodium ion. How many of you know what a sodium ion might be? Pretty much, okay, it's just going to be a, um, a one atom of sodium, okay? So it's the most basic uh, building block of matter, right? So we're going to be able to let just one sodium in or one sodium out, depending on a number of different factors, okay? Everybody with me so far? Yes? Okay. So, um, I forgot to say that I hope it looks like it, we are in here, but hopefully everybody is within proximity to somebody else because we're going to do a couple of, this isn't even on, can you guys hear me in the back okay? Yeah? Turn it on? Okay. Is that a little bit better? Can you hear louder? Okay, well, I'll try and talk a little bit louder. There is battery. Oh, no, it's sliding up. I'll try and talk louder. <laughs> um, okay, so what I like to do in my classes is have you discuss questions with your proximate neighbors around you. So we're going to do a couple of these as we kind of move through the lecture. Uh, the first one we're going to do is uh, try and just build up our kind of sense for how uh, basic phenomena work that are important for how our neuron is going to actually work. Okay. So, the question here is, what does it mean to say something flows down its concentration gradient? And to kind of help you with that idea, we have two compartments, and there are these little, um, basically, tunnels, or you could also think of them as proteins, right? Uh, what is going to happen to these particles in this little figure? Okay, so just take a second, see if you can draw what you think is going to happen and ask your, your neighbors about what this means. What does it say, what does it mean to say something's gonna flow down your concentrate, a, a concentration gradient, okay? And I actually mean it when I want you to actually talk, okay? So go ahead. Okay, so those of you lucky enough to sit next to the bio major, you're gonna have a better time tonight probably. <laughs> so that's good. Um, okay, so tell me what you think. What does this mean to say something's gonna flow down its concentration gradient? What do you think? Somebody? See those of you that took the class it's just fall apart. So yep. the, it's going to go from like more concentrated to less concentrated. So the the balls on the left side are going to go. Some of them are going to go to the right side. That's right. When are, when are they going to stop going? When they're about equal on both sides. Yeah. And does anybody know what that state would be called? Equilibrium. Equilibrium. Okay. So these are things that you already intuitively probably know, but maybe don't necessarily have you know, a description of in, a, in, in science jargon, okay? So you are absolutely right. We're going to have uh, our, our particles or whatever we're going to call these flow to the opposite side. And at the point at which they're about equal on each side, we're still going to have them moving back and forth. But the rate at which they are going is going to actually be constant, okay? And that's a state that we call equilibrium. Can you think of other phenomena that actually kind of observe this rule too. We have particles here, yeah. When you spray perfume in a room after a while. <laughs> That's a good one that I have not had before. When you spray perfume or anything in a room, right? It's going to diffuse out until it reaches equilibrium. Yeah. Temperature? Temperature, yeah. That's the one other one I really was thinking about. So we have a, a hot surface and you put it in contact with a cold surface, for example my hand and the table. Eventually, the table underneath my hand is going to end up warming up, right? And that's actually the point at which it's not going to feel cold to you anymore, incidentally, okay? Okay, so do you feel like you have a sense for this idea of things going down their concentration gradient? They're going to go from a place that's highly concentrated down to the opposite, or uh, until they are um, at an equilibrium state, yeah? We're good? Okay. Okay, so... Cells actually use energy to create concentration gradients across their, their lipid membrane, okay? So this is that lipid membrane that we looked at before. This is the outside of our cell, this is the inside of our cell. And you see these little yellow blobs that say ATP. Does anybody know what ATP is? Yeah. Adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate, that's right. Does anybody want to tell us what that actually means for those of us that are bio majors? Yeah. Well, I'm not a bio major. Okay, but you know what it is. Excellent. Yeah. What is it? It's a chemical that can, use, that can be quickly broken down to release excess energy. That's exactly right. So this is a little molecule that you can think of as the money of your body, okay? It is a little molecule that holds on to energy, and your body knows how to use it um, to do work, 
right? It takes energy to do work. You know that. Um, we know that it takes money to actually buy things. It's the same kind of thing. You can think of ATP as, a, as the energetic currency of your body and actually of pretty much every living thing on the planet. So your cell is going to actually use energy to create a concentration gradient on purpose across this membrane. And that is the fundamental basis for how neurons actually work. Okay, it's a really simple concept, but it's, it's absolutely critical for understanding how they're actually going to function. Okay, so any questions on that? Yeah. Is ATP a polysaccharide? No, it's, it's a polysaccharide would be a sugar. ATP okay. is its own unique molecule. It has these three high phosphate bonds on it that are, have a lot of energy in them. Okay. Any other questions? Great. Okay, so that's our, our cell basics. Then we're going to move on to talk about the actual nervous system. Um, and I like to think about the nervous system as the wired communication system in your body. You have two communication systems. You have the wired system, which is the nervous system, and you also have a wireless system, which are the hormones in your body, okay? Um, we're not going to talk about end the endocrine system or hormones today. We're obviously going to spend our time on the nervous system. But when you think about these two things in comparison, the nervous system is fast. Okay, the nervous system um, can actually conduct signals up to 225 miles per hour in some cases. That means that you can actually think about how long it would take an impulse in the brain of a blue whale to get to the tail of the blue whale. And you can actually, there's actually a, a, a bit of a lag there because blue whales are quite long. Okay? But they're so, they're so fast that it actually works, right? Our 100 foot long blue whale can actually keep his tail moving in time with its, with its brain. Um, I wanted to also note that I know that there's going to be a lot of info on these slides and I can give you a PDF of them if that would be helpful for you guys. Okay, so don't try, try not to worry about writing every little thing down. Okay. Um, so more kind of just general anatomy of our nervous system. We have, of course, our central nervous system, which is made up of our brain and the spinal cord. Okay. And then we have what's called the peripheral nervous system, which is made up of all the other uh, neurons in your body. Okay? And that includes these um, spinal nerves that come off of the uh, spinal column. They have these little bulges at the, at the base of them called ganglia. This is also showing you some of the cranial nerves that come down. And these are some of the nerves that your dentist is going to put lidocaine in to block when you have a root canal or, uh, or, or dental work done. So we have the central nervous system, we have the peripheral nervous system. All the neurons work in a similar fashion at this level. Okay? There's going to be differences in different parts of the body once you get into the real nitty gritty of it, but in general they all work very similarly. If we kind of drill down a little bit more and we look at the basic anatomy of the brain, this figure is showing you um, a shark brain, an alligator brain, a pig brain, and then our brain. Okay? And the different, the kind of, there's, you can you can dice this up a lot of ways, but the kind of main parts are the cerebrum. Okay, if somebody's really cerebral, what are they? Have you heard that term before? What are they? In their head. Before. They're they're in their heads. They sometimes it's it's kind of a euphemism for being very intellectual, right? Okay, so if somebody's very cerebral, they're kind of up in their head, and that's because the cerebrum is the part of the brain that is associated with our higher functioning thought, right? Thought, emotion, reasoning, memory. The cerebellum, okay, so this is the cerebrum, all this, this gray stuff with all the wrinkles, okay? This blue part is the cerebellum, and a little memory trick for you is the cerebellum is kind of a more embellished looking word, and the cerebellum itself always reminds me of being more of an embellished looking part of the brain. It has these very fine creases all over it. It's got all these fine little knots all over it. The cerebellum's job is to integrate um, sensory information and motor information. So this is going to be where a lot of the input from your everyday environment gets brought into. Um, and gets integrated with all of your, you know, movement and that kind of thing. Then we have our brain stem, and that is the part here in red. And this is the part of your body, of your brain that's the oldest, evolutionarily speaking. You notice all of these animals have very well developed brain stems in red. Um, and this is the part of your brain that is your, um, you know, 
physiological center, right? It's going to control breathing, it's going to control heart rate, all of the things that you don't really need to think about, right? Um, someone can actually be, uh, have a, a lot of damage to the rest of the brain, be in a coma, but still be breathing and their heartbeat uh, going just fine as long as this, this brain stem is intact, okay? Any questions about, about our basic kind of brain anatomy? Yeah. Um, so how come like, a, like all the other animals, even if they don't have like reasoning or whatever, how can they still have cerebral? Well, you're still going to have memory and there is reasoning, right? I mean, if you've ever met a shark, they're pretty good at reasoning actually. So okay. there's other functions and, and we're talking about very simple aspects of the brain today. And if you talk to a neuroscientist that actually does work, they're going to tell you infinitely more intricate things that, that this part of the brain actually does. Okay, so. We're going at a very kind of basic level here. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so the cerebellum is like in the context of neuroplasticity, because you're always learning new movements, and like if you can train in a sport, or mm -hmm. you're you can uh, better kind of synchronize your, your movements. Uh -huh. uh, so is the cerebellum like is that part that particularly plastic part of the brain? Uh, you know, I don't know if it's more plastic than the rest of your brain. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, do you guys know if anyone heard that? I haven't heard that per se, per se but that's a really good question. Yeah, it be something to look into for sure. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, I also wanted to point out, this is a cross-section, so if we were just to take a cut through the brain, it wouldn't be so good for you, but um, for this person, we can take a look here. All of this kind of more yellow-looking tissue on the outside is, the, is what's called the gray matter. How many of you have heard gray matter, white matter? Okay. So this is the, what's called the gray matter, and all this stuff on the inside is what's called the white matter. Okay. And we're going to come back and learn why it's gray and why it's white in a minute, but I just want to point out the anatomy of it first. Um, and you also have all these kind of ridges, right? Um, do you want to know the technical name for the ridges? Yeah. Okay. Uh, gyri and sulci. Okay. So the the ridge part is called the gyrus, and then the the valley part is called the sulcus. So it's just a you know something to impress your friends at dinner party with. Okay. If we look at the spinal cord. Okay. So what we're looking at here is a cross section through your back. Um, this is the the bony part of your back. And then you have the spinal cord itself in here. And if we zoom in and look at this a little bit more closely, this is a bottle, so it doesn't quite have the same texture look to it as the other one did. Um, but we have white matter and gray matter in your spinal cord as well. So this is the gray matter, and this is the white matter. Do you notice something different between the gray matter and white matter in the spinal cord versus the brain? Yeah. So the brain, the gray matter is on the outside, the white matter. That's exactly right. So in the brain, we have gray matter on the outside, and we have white matter on the inside. In the uh, spinal cord, we have white matter on the outside, and we have gray matter on the inside. And I'll tell you more about why that's important in a little while. Okay, so that's kind of the anatomy of the higher, higher structures in the nervous system. So what we're going to do next is actually look at the basic building block of the nervous system, which is the neuron. So our neuron, um, these are the cells in the nervous system that send and receive signals uh, throughout the nervous system, right? They actually send what are called electrochemical signals, and we're actually going to delve into what that means in a few minutes. Um, and they communicate information from other cells, uh, from cells in one part of the body to other parts of the body. They also take information in from our environment, and they send that information to our brain. All animals have, have uh, neurons except sponges, okay? Sponges are actually considered animals, but they don't actually have neurons. The number of neurons that you have, if you are a human or an animal, varies widely as a function of the size of the animal and also the behavioral complexity of the animal, okay? So if we think back to uh, this figure right here, um, we have a lot less neurons in the brain than, of course, our human pigs. Who knew, right? Really smart animals actually have a lot of cerebrum and also the wrinkles, right? The gyri and sulci um, is also correlated with uh, kind of intellectual complexity, if you will. I'm sure in this class you guys actually talk about what that actually means, so I, I will leave it there. <laughs> um, okay, so if we drill down and think 
more about our single neuron. Okay, this is the building block of the brain. And this is, you know, if you just kind of take a step back for a second, this little cell in the aggregate is responsible for you, right? It's responsible for everything you think and everything you do. When you think about that in, in an ironic way, it's really cool, right? So this very simple looking structure, um, extremely complex. So these are the, this is, let's think about the anatomy of this cell, okay? So we start up here at the top with this cell. So we actually are looking at two cells. So we have this cell right here, okay? And that is going to be, in the rest of the lecture, that's going to be our presynaptic cell. So make a little note, presynaptic cell, okay? And I'm going to tell you what a synapse here is in a minute. And the cell that it's connected to, the one that's going to come second, is going to be our postsynaptic cell, okay? And that's just kind of some language that helps us um, understand which cell we're actually talking about when we're looking at a group of cells. So if we start at the top with our presynaptic cell, you notice all these little arms on the top, right? These are called dendrites. How many of you have heard that term before, dendrites? Okay, great. So dendrites, these are the incoming signals to our neuron. So they take information in to the cell, okay? Uh, dendrites can take on lots of different forms. They can be just a single, long, um, you know, protrusion. So they can have lots of branches, for example. Under, or connected to that is going to be the cell body. You can also sometimes see it um, discussed as the soma, okay? This is where we're going to have the nucleus and all of the organelles that I talked about when we just first introduced the cell, okay? So that's where all that stuff is going to be found. And then we also have this other part that's going to come down, and that's the axon, okay? And this is actually the part of the cell that's going to transmit information away from the cell. So what you should be getting from this is that information flows in a neuron in just one direction, okay? It comes into the dendrite, it goes through the cell body, and then it flows out the axon, okay? So anybody have a question about that so far? Okay. So I said before that we talked about the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell. Well, what the heck is a synapse? Does anybody know what a synapse is? Yeah. The space between um, the um, axon and the dendrites in the next cell? Yeah, so it's the space where our axon of our presynaptic cell is going to meet up with the dendrites or sometimes the cell body of our postsynaptic cell, okay? So we have two parts. We have the synaptic terminal, which is the end of the axon. So this little structure here that is being drawn is found in this part of our presynaptic cell, okay? Get that? That's this, this, this structure here. This part, okay, down here, that is on our postsynaptic cell, okay? So this is the synaptic terminal, and the space between our presynaptic and our postsynaptic cell, that's called the synapse, okay? Um, and this is the site of communication between one cell and the next cell. And magical stuff happens here, okay? This is where the real business part of neurons is going to be found, and we'll get there uh, toward, the, toward the end of this. Okay, so any questions about our terminology or, or how this works? Yeah? Do they ever call it the synaptic cleft? Yeah, yeah, that's another term. Exactly Absolutely. Synaptic. Yeah, this sometimes is called a synaptic cleft. Yeah, totally. <laughs> any other questions? How many of you have heard all this stuff before in like, high school bio? So we're kind of doing a review. Okay, good. Well, great. So here's some uh, pictures of some different neurons. Okay, this is the cell body of a neuron. These are a whole bunch of neurons in aggregate. Okay, these are all the cell bodies, the dendrites, and these are axons. This is that so, uh, synaptic terminal. Okay, so this is the axon coming down. This is the actual ax uh, 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 synapse or, or the synaptic terminal here, and it's. Uh, actually inserting on a huge muscle cell, okay? So that's another good item to know is that neurons obviously don't just connect with other neurons, right? They're going to actually innervate or land on uh, muscles and organs and all kinds of other structures in the body, okay? 
And then this is a really awesome um, micrograph picture, a light microscope picture, of a synaptic terminal and a synaptic cleft, okay? And that's the space right here. Um, this is one neuron inserting on another neuron. And we're gonna come to understand what all this red stuff is toward the end of the lecture. Okay, so this is what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to consider this question with your neighbor. How might the function of a neuron with more dendrites, what do the dendrites do again? They take signals in. So how might the function of a neuron with more dendrites be different than one with fewer dendrites? And these are just some examples. This is, this is one um, type of neuron. All of these are dendrites. This is a different type of neuron. There's a lot of dendrites, but they're kind of spread out. And then this is a different kind of neuron um, with a lot of small dendrites and not, uh, not that many dendrites. Okay, so take a few minutes and see if you can work out what the significance of the difference and spatial arrangement and number of dendrites might be. Then, nobody's brave enough to guess. Yeah. Um, you were saying maybe something with sensory input would have a neuron with more um, dendrites because it's receiving more information, like say in your fingertips or something. That's perfect. That's exactly right. Right? It's not that. It's not not too much of a stretch to say, okay, well, if you have a whole bunch of dendrites, you have a whole bunch of inputs, right? Because that is the input into the neuron. And so in places where you have a whole bunch of inputs, like you said, in certain sensory parts of your body, uh, for example, touch at the tips of your fingertips, um, you're going to have a whole bunch of information coming into that one neuron. In other places, you might just have a couple of dendrites uh, that are actually coming into that neuron. And this really contributes to a lot of complexity in the nervous system, okay? Depending on how many inputs you have uh, can make a huge difference on how that neuron actually is going to integrate information with other neurons, okay? Yeah. This might be a dumb question. No, no dumb question. But, um, <coughs> so when you talk about like plasticity and like new connections moving around, would the dendrites be moving in new directions? This is a great question. We have, we'll, we'll get to that idea of plasticity. Have you guys already talked about plasticity or is this just from the, the paper? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, so plasticity can come about in different ways, okay? Um, one of them would be making new dendrites. And I'm actually going to show you a, a, a picture in a minute of a study that actually looked at that um, involving cocaine-addicted rats, okay? So this is really cool um, stuff. Okay, so this is those same, um, those same neurons that you just looked at. This is our kind of simple, generic neuron. Um, these, are, uh, these are neurons that you find in your eye. Okay, in your retina. Um, these are neurons that you find in the cerebellum, right? I told you that the cerebellum is involved in integrating sensory information and motor information. You have lots of inputs coming into one cell body and one single axon. Um, these are um, called pyramidal cells and they are found actually in the cerebral cortex. They're actually found in the, the gray matter part of the, of the brain, okay? You could do this all day. There's lots and lots of variety and the kind of neurons that you can see um, in the body. Yeah. So is it kind of important that like you kind of have like a, uh, you know, so you notice that this one doesn't have a lot of sensory input, because if, if the whole brain looked like that, it would just be a complete mess, right? Yeah, and I'm not going to pretend to like understand all of the intricacies of neuroanatomy um, today, certainly I'm not a neurologist, but, um, but there is a, a lot of significance actually about how many dendrites you have coming in, how those change over so this is that study I was talking about. So one of the ways that uh, you can have plasticity in the brain, and you can change the brain. And I usually start off my, my classes in the quarter by talking about the fact that at the beginning of the class, you are fundamentally a different person than you are at the end of the class because you fundamentally change your neurons. The structure of your neurons actually changes when you learn something. So if you've done a good job over the quarter, by the time you get to the end of the quarter, your brain should actually look fundamentally different than it did on day one, which is a really cool idea, right? I think so. Oh, awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Very good enthusiasm. <laughs> now, the other way you can really fundamentally change your brain is by doing drugs. And you don't want that kind of change, okay? <laughs> you don't want that kind of change. So this is a study that actually looked at um, some, some poor little rats that they got addicted to cocaine, okay? And they, they made it so that these rats could just uh, touch a lever and they get a little dose. Um, over time, very quickly, they get addicted, of course. And 
over time, they looked at what the dendrites in certain parts of the brain, that's the part, the nucleus of come in, the neocortex, um, they looked at the spines of the dendrites, okay? So this would be like one of the dendrites coming into the cell body. And if you notice, in the control animals, they have a bunch of little spines. But then if you look at the animals that are um, addicted to cocaine, those spines are, are larger, there's more of them, and there's uh, more of these little swellings, okay? Um, and, and there's a lot that this paper actually talks about, but the take-home point is that you can physically alter the the dendrites or other parts of the neurons with something like cocaine, okay? It's, it's kind of craving more sensory input. We can get into this to that later, but essentially this is a nice, uh, a nice uh, a visual for how the brain actually can change. It's very classic. Yeah? What was the time frame of this? You know, I think it was over like a month or two months. It was pretty, um, pretty quick, yeah. What, the other sad part about this was, um, I might be mixing this up with a different study, but I'm pretty sure it was this study that uh, there was actually female uh, rats that were pregnant and they gave birth and then they basically totally abandoned their pups for the cocaine. So they just sat there and, and hit cocaine like 24 hours a day. And it, was, it was actually a really sad story, you know, but um, it gives us kind of interesting data. <laughs> so there you go. Okay, so. That was a little there was side. a question. Oh yeah, where? Sorry. It's okay. Um, so do different drugs have different impacts on your dendrite? So cocaine added dendrites, but would a different drug like a downer rather than an upper like decrease? Yeah, we're gonna actually talk totally about downers and uppers or how that might actually work at the end if we get there. But yeah. And I don't mean to imply that this is the only way that drugs affect your brain. Okay? There's actually another way that they affect your brain that we're gonna talk about and that actually involves the synapse itself. So this is just one example of how it can Okay, so I wanted to point out a special structure of the axon, okay, and that is something called the myelin sheath. How many of you have heard of the myelin sheath? Okay, great. So the myelin sheath is basically a layer of fat or insulation that is wrapped around the axon, which is the part that's coming out of the cell body. Okay, it's the part that takes the signal away from the neuron, and. There are specialized cells in different parts of the, of the nervous system that actually do this, but they wrap their lipid bilayer, right? They have this fatty membrane that is surrounding them. They specialize that membrane and they actually wrap it around the axon. Any idea why that would be helpful? What function it might serve? Yeah? Um, it speeds up transitions. It keeps them from like, accidentally going to a different cell. Yeah, so, so that's exactly right. So this is analogous, this uh, insulation layer is analogous to shielding on wire, okay? It does speed up the transmission down the axon, for sure, for reasons you might talk about when you actually have your uh, actual potential lecture. Um, but the other big thing it does is it actually prevents our electrochemical signal, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, from jumping to other axons. So it prevents interference between the outgoing signal of our neuron. Okay, so you can think of them as insulated um, wires. Okay, um, and I bring this up again because it's the white matter is made up of all the axons, and the gray matter is made up of all the cell bodies and dendrites. Okay, so white matter is white because it's surrounded by this layer of fat. Okay, and so in the brain. All of the outgoing information is crisscrossing through the middle of the brain, okay? Whereas, oh, I don't think I put the, um, the vertebral column up, but in the vertebral column, the axons are actually leaving, right? They're actually uh, sending information away from the spinal cord. So does that make sense? So we've got information crossing in the brain like this, and then we've got information kind of sending signals away from the spinal cord. Certainly there are also um, in, information can be in the spinal cord, that's not to say that's not the case, but it's arranged a bit differently in the spinal cord versus the brain. Okay? Questions? Okay, so another um, word I wanted to, to introduce to you is this term glia, which is Greek for glue, and these are all the support cells in the brain. So the brain is not just made up of neurons, okay, there's actually a whole bunch of other cells that help the brain and all of the rest of your nerves actually function. One of the big ones are called astrocytes. And 
and they do a lot of different things. Um, they provide some structural support for neurons. Um, they help regulate the uh, ion concentration that surrounds the neuron for really important reasons, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and more, somewhat more recently, there's been research that's shown that astrocytes are actually also involved in learning and memory. So they're not just the kind of support structure, they actually take an active role in, in these other uh, memory and uh, learning processes. The other big thing that astrocytes do is they help establish this thing called the blood brain barrier. How many of you have heard of that before? What do you think it is? If you had to describe the blood brain barrier to like, you know, your mom or something, how would you do that? Yeah. Uh, it keeps most chemicals in your bloodstream from interfering with, uh, with your brain, especially like bacteria. Okay, so it kind of acts as a filter. Yeah. What do you? What would you? How do you imagine it? Like, what does it look like in your mind? Is it like a, a net that's all around your whole brain, or is it around the neuron, or is it around the blood vessels? What do you think? Someone is mumbling over here. What do you say? Any, any guesses? Yeah. I would say it was like blood vessels and it's what that Around the blood vessels? Okay, so when I actually was learning all this stuff, I always pictured the blood brain barrier, so you always hear it in shows and in the media and stuff. I always pictured it as this, you know, big covering over the brain and the spinal cord. That's totally not what this. You do have a covering over your brain and spinal cord, but that's not this. Okay, this is actually, um, <clears throat> essentially a filter that surrounds all the capillaries in your brain and in your central nervous system in particular. And astrocytes, which are depicted by these little star-looking star cells, um, actually really uh, form the basis of that uh, blood-brain barrier. And you're exactly right. The job of the blood-brain barrier is to tightly regulate what gets in and out of the neurons, okay, or kind of in and around neurons. Your brain is your most important organ, right? You can't function without it. And so we want to be extra careful that we're not letting any bacteria or viruses or other pathogens get in there, right? <coughs> this is actually a better depiction of what it looks like. So there's astrocytes and also these other cells that are involved, but they, um, they, they kind of insert on a capillary. So this is a capillary. You can see red blood cells inside. And they form this layer of protection that surrounds all the capillaries in the brain. And astrocytes are, are really key for forming that in development. I also wanted to mention, this is more just kind of interesting, probably more than useful for you in this class, but this is interesting because that blood-brain barrier is so good that it actually presents a problem if we're trying to cure the disease. So let's say you have a brain tumor and you'd like to get um, chemotherapy drugs into the brain to actually try to attack those cancer cells. Well, a lot of these chemotherapy drugs can actually get across the blood-brain barrier. So some of the newer technologies have um, been developing basically what are like Trojan forces. So there are some molecules that can cross the blood-brain barrier. You can pair that with a chemotherapy drug. You can kind of get that chemical across the blood-brain barrier, you can sneak it across without the blood-brain barrier knowing and get those ke uh, chemotherapy drugs actually into the brain where they can start to work on that, um, that tumor. This is also a um, kind of a news article about a study that just came out uh, this month, actually, um, about leaky blood vessels in the brain potentially being a um, risk factor for Alzheimer's. And when they're talking about leaky blood vessels, they're actually talking about that blood-brain barrier being a little bit leaky, so not, not being as good as it should be. Apparently, according to this one single study I will, let, I will mention, um, this may be associated with people that uh, are more likely to get uh, Alzheimer's disease. And also, your blood vessels actually just get more leaky the older that you get. So, unfortunately for you and all of us, this will be start happening as we age. Okay? Any questions about that? Is that the only thing that was aging me? Yeah. Oh, probably not. not. There's probably a whole bunch of other ones that we don't even know about. I mean, I don't think anyone was really looking for <laughs> leaky blood vessels in the brain until just recently, so I'm sure they'll go out and find a whole bunch of little things for Any other ideas or questions? This is another.
another view of an astrocyte, a very beautiful, you can see why they're called astrocytes because you could tell somebody that that was a, um, you know, picture from the Hubble Space Telescope and they probably would have been different. Um, and then this is another uh, stain picture of an astrocyte as well. So really cool looking cells. Okay, so we're moving right along. Most of what we're going to talk about is in this session, which is how neurons actually function. I'm just going to warn you that we're going to talk a lot about ions. Is there anybody that's confused about what an ion is? Or is there somebody that would like to tell us what an ion is? What do you think? Anybody? Okay, yeah. It's an atom or molecule with a charge. That's right. So it's just a charged particle. So things that you normally refer to as salts often are ions, right? So sodium chloride, it's a sodium plus a chloride, uh, negative and positive charge, okay? So ions are really important for how neurons actually function, so we're going to look at some fancy PowerPoint slides that actually you know, show us how these work, all right? Okay, so we're going to start with this idea of an electrical potential across the membrane, okay? So all cells maintain an electrical potential across the membrane. What the heck does that even mean, right? Does anybody have a kind of a sense for what that might mean or, or never heard of it before? Who's never heard of this before? Okay, so some of you have probably heard about it in high school bio, but we'll revisit. So what does that actually mean? Well, in practice what it means is that if you were to um, take a voltage meter, you know, like your volt meter that you get down at Radio Shack, use a little more sophisticated one for this, but essentially the same principle, and you were to put a little electrode inside a cell and hook it up to a reference electrode, you would measure a, a voltage across the cell membrane, okay? And that voltage would be negative, and it would be probably in the neighborhood of 60 to 80, negative 60 to negative 80, okay? So you can also think of this um, in a different way. So electric potential is to this word voltage um, as uh, voltage is to the flow of these electrically charged particles, these ions, as pressure is to the flow of water. So you could think about voltage as electrical pressure, if you will. Okay? Um, in wires that carry your electricity, right, our electric current is going to be carried by electrons. That's a, an idea that you should be kind of somewhat familiar with. In cells, our current is actually going to be carried by these, pot, these um, charged ions like sodium, calcium, chloride, that kind of thing, okay? Anybody, everybody with me so far? Okay, so in our neurons, the resting potential of our neuron is generally going to be between negative 60 and negative 80, and that negative sign means that the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside of the cell, okay? So in general, that usually means that we have more negatively charged particles inside the cell than we have outside the cell. Okay? Everybody on the same page with that? Okay. So the question is, what actually causes this resting potential? Okay, how do we, we call it the resting potential? Um, this is the cell's uh, difference in charge, right? How negative it is inside uh, when it's just sitting there, it's not doing anything, okay? It's just doing its normal function. So we call that the resting potential. And it's largely um, a result of differences in concentration between sodium and potassium, and also some negative charge particles like chloride, okay? So we're gonna walk through this slow, and, and just stop me if I, uh, if I lose you, okay? Because it is kind of a difficult concept. So how do we get this resting potential? Well, there are two forces that are at work, and they work in opposite directions to get us to this resting potential. The first is the tendency of ions to diffuse down their concentration gradient. We started off this little lecture with that idea of what a concentration gradient is. Okay, so you all should have sort of a feeling for how that works. The other force that's at work is the tendency of opposite charged particles to attract each other. Okay, so you know that positives are attracted to negatives, right? What do positives and positives do and negatives and negatives do? They actually repel each other, right? So like charged particles repel each other, but opposite charged particles attract each other. Okay, does everybody feel comfortable with these two ideas? Yeah? Is it hot? Are you warm? It's, 
it's overheating. <laughs> oh no, it's overheating. Okay. We're just smoking in here. Yeah. Now, how come all of the potassiums 
don't just go out. We end up keeping some of our potassiums inside the cell. What do you think? Any ideas? Do we get too negative? They might get too negative inside. That's, that's actually right on the right track. So at some point, there's going to end up being a balance between the positive charge of our potassium and the negative charge inside the cell. And that negative charge is sort of like, you can sort of think of it like a magnet or a rope that's pulling on the positively charged particles of potassium to come back in. But on the opposite side, we have this tendency for potassium to want to go down its concentration gradient. So that's where we get this electrochemical gradient. It's a tug of war between the tendency for the, the negative charged particles inside to pull back on these positively charged potassiums and the um, concentration gradient between calcium, or, uh, uh, potassium on the inside and potassium on the outside actually wanting potassium to go down its gradient. Okay? So it's a tug of war between these two forces, the attraction of the negative on potassium and it's, de it's desire, right, to actually slow down its concentration rate. That's a lot. Does anybody have a question about that? You feel like you kind of have a, a sense for that? Yeah. What did you say the ATP uh, comes into that equation? What does it do? Uh, yeah. The ATP is what's going to establish the concentration gradient in the first place. Okay, so it's going to pump potassium in and sodium out. And that kind of gives us the, it sets the stage okay. for the rest of this to actually work. And these, um, these little uh, proteins are always working, okay? They're always sitting there pumping, 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 pumping potassium in and sodium out, okay? Okay, any questions? Yeah? And what's the outside? What's the outside? Yeah. Oh, so, so that's a great question. So are, all your cells are bathed in something called intercellular, uh, interstitial fluid? Um, or extracellular fluid. It's just some fluid that's actually surrounding all of your cells. Have you heard of the expression that works big bags of water walking around, right? You're, you're mostly water. Well, a lot of that water is actually uh, water that is bathing all of your cells. And what you're, that's the media of life, right? We need to have that, um, that solution that you can actually put, put the cells in. Okay? So that's what it's doing. Yeah? So these channels don't let the sodium stuck in them. That's exactly right. So these channels are specific for a specific ion. Okay, so they only let potassium in. There's actually other channels, there's a lot of other channels that actually only let sodium flow, and there's ones that are for calcium. Okay? Yeah. I've heard that if you're having like a major like leg cramp or something, you're supposed to like drink salt water and help relieve that. Cramp. One of the, there's, there are a number of different causes for cramping, and there's actually some that are not well understood, but one of the causes is a, an electrolyte imbalance. Another word for all these charged particles are electrolytes, okay? Um, how many of you like to drink Gatorade? No one <laughs> Seriously, no one drinks Gatorade? Or, the, you know, organic could be Gatorade that has no artificial color in it. Yeah.
we've established what the resting membrane potential is, right? It's this negative value, and it's built on differences in ion concentrations that we just learned about. The inaction potential is going to result from a sudden change in that resting potential. So let's say we've gone from negative 60, suddenly we get to positive 60, okay, or positive 70, and then we're going to come back down. So we're going to have a big change in that resting membrane potential, and that actually constitutes an action potential. <coughs> and we're going to leave it there, and you'll learn a lot more about that in a few weeks. The other big um, kind of important part about action potentials is that the change in the resting membrane potential it doesn't actually happen across the whole membrane at once. It doesn't happen in the whole cell at once. It's a localized effect that actually happens along that long axon, for example. Okay, So our axon, it has a cell membrane, just like we just talked about. And all the way down that axon, this change in the resting membrane potential is going to occur. And it's going to occur in a linear, self-propagating fashion. And what that means is that it continually regenerates itself down the axon. Okay? I'll show you a little diagram of that in a moment. When the action potential, another thing that you could say if you're getting confused about what that term action potential means, is when the change in the resting membrane potential actually arrives at the other end of the neuron, so when it gets to the end of the axon, it's actually going to do something. Okay? It's going to either result in the release of neurotransmitters. Anybody know what a neurotransmitter is? What do you think? Name one. Dopamine. Dopamine. Acetylcholine. Serotonin. Serotonin. Okay, you guys know what those are. So um, it's going to actually result in the release or the inhibition of neurotransmitters. What does inhibition mean? Prevention. Okay, so it's either going to inhibit or prevent neurotransmitters from being released, depending on the neuron, or it's actually going to cause neurotransmitters to be released. And where are those neurotransmitters going to get released into? Into the synaptic, the synaptic cleft, yeah. And they're going to interact with our postsynaptic neuron or potentially another cell, okay? So if we're talking about a neuron that's actually innervating or, or um, uh, on top of inter, uh, interacting with a muscle cell, it's going to release a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine which is going to go through a series of steps and eventually result in that muscle actually contracting, okay? So what happens in the synapse is, is really key to the function of the neuron, and the synapse knows when to fire or not fire based on when and if an action potential arrives there, okay? Any questions on that so far? You guys kind of on the same page, you think? Yes, no? So, action potentials really form the basis for the entire function of the nervous system, including you know, sensory information that you're, you're hearing me right now because action potentials are firing from your uh, ear and into your uh, neurons that are running from your ear into your brain, and then your brain is interpreting the firing of those action potentials as my voice. Okay? So, including you know, sight, same thing. So all of your sensory information, all the thoughts that you're having about this, like, oh my gosh, we're talking about neurons, all of that is because of active potentials, okay? Um, and memories as well. Okay, so how does an action potential actually get started? Well, this is our cartoon axon, or our, our cartoon, cartoon neurons, okay? What are these parts down here? The dendrites, that's the incoming part. This is the cell body. This is the axon, okay? And these yellow things are the, the myelin, okay? And then this is the um, axon terminal. And again, neurons take information, they only travel in one direction. So we have sensory input that's going to end up causing something to happen down here. And then it's going to end up sending that information down the axon, uh, depending on how strong that is. So an example would be a mechanoreceptor. Does anybody know what a mechanoreceptor is? Yeah? You're not one of the... Um, it's, it's something that uh, receives mechanical stimulation, which is like touch or movement, or uh, it could also be orientation. Okay, yeah, exactly. So I'm touching the table right here, and I feel the table on my hands, right? 
right? And that information, I feel it because a, a sensation or an action potential is being generated by my touching this table. That's actually getting all the way up neurons through my arm, into my spinal cord, and into my brain. And my brain is interpreting the signal of me touching the table and interpreting what that means, okay? The very ends of my neurons in my fingertips are going to start that off, and the dendrites of those neurons that are in my fingertips are actually what are going to start um, the detection of that. So there's actually little channels, okay, ion channels, that are in the ends of the dendrites of this neuron. And if we're going to stick with touch, then the type of, of ion channel that's in the ends of these neurons are called mechanoreceptors, and that's, what, that's the spelling of that right there. And all that means is that there are little ion gates, in this case sodium, okay? And when they get deformed by mechanical deformation, right, when we actually push on the membrane, it actually causes some of those channels to open a little bit. And that is going to let ions flow. Now, we just talked about the fact that we work really hard to make this concentration gradient. If we open up a channel for sodium, what is going to happen to the inside of our cell? What's going to happen to our resting membrane potential if we let sodium move up? It's going to make it less negative. Another way of saying that would be it gets more positive. Right? So sodium is a positively charged particle. When we deform the membrane at the end of this neuron, we open up little channels that actually let some of that sodium in. And so we actually raise our resting membrane potential a little bit, okay? And you'll get into the more of the details of this when you do action potentials. But essentially what's going to happen is if the stimulus is strong enough, in other words, if I push hard enough and I deform the membrane enough and I let enough sodium in, that eventually is going to lead to an action potential firing. Okay? And you can take this example and you can think of it for lots of other things like uh, a hormone binding to, to a receptor in the dendrites. Um, uh, there's, there's lots of different examples of this. Okay, so we're going to leave it at this for now. If the stimulus, touch, light, a chemical, is strong enough to surpass some threshold, okay, what is the threshold? It's some, some line that we're going to cross in the resting membrane potential. If we, so if we surpass that threshold, that's actually going to result in that action potential. Again, the action potential is a change in the resting potential, actually firing and going down the axon. If, on the other hand, the stimulus is too weak, then we don't fire the action potential. The information does not make it to our brain, and we don't actually perceive that we're touching anything. Okay? If you could potentially touch this table so lightly that you couldn't perceive it, that is the, that's an indicator that you haven't touched it hard enough to let enough sodium into these neurons and actually cause an action potential to get to your brain so that your brain is aware that you're actually touching something. Okay? That's, kind of, that's kind of a big idea. Does anybody have a question about that? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, so what happens when, this might be too long of an explanation, but what happens when you stop becoming aware of something and you know you're like I'm sitting on this chair? Such a good question. Such a good question that we're going to talk about at the end. Okay? Yeah. Right. Good question. Um, that's something called the situation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Am I totally losing you guys or are we kind of keeping up okay? <laughs> Raise your hand if you feel like we're, we're kind of moving along all right. Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, anybody completely just like, what are we talking about? You're welcome to say yes or pull it on. Okay, we're going good. Uh, did you have a question? Um, is there, do you know anyone doing research in like, action potentials and you see, you know, like, 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 Um, I don't personally know of anyone. I did run across a little cool figure that I don't think I ended up including in this, but, um, Remind me at the very end, and we'll, I'll, uh, I'll mention that when we get to habituation. Actually. Okay, so we've totally blown past our break time. You guys want to take a break? Hey, okay. Is there anyone that has confusion about this electrochemical gradient? I, I have to go into all this detail because we can't really understand the cool stuff. And I was making this point about electromagnetic instruments. Yeah. Now, remember to. I, a, lot, a lot of you are being seen playing with your mobiles and such. Please turn them off. That was our deal. 
Yes. This is an intercontinental flight. All <laughs> electronics are off. Okay. Okay. So, so excellent. So, sorry. Uh, is there any confusion about that? Because if you don't understand this idea of arresting memory potential, it's really hard to understand how drugs affect you and also how you work. Okay. So, and and how we're not going to get into memory so much, but but the principles of the chain snap it back to you. Good. Good. Okay. Okay, so what I want you to do is get together with your neighbor and I'll give you like four or five minutes to do this. And we're gonna actually draw a graph. So apologies if you're like graph phobic, but we're gonna draw a little graph and I promise it won't hurt, okay? But what you're gonna do is you're gonna have the membrane potential here and we're gonna have time on the x-axis. Okay? So remember the membrane potential, what is it? It's about negative 16 to 80, so pick negative 70, and it doesn't, you don't have to have like numbers on this graph, okay? You're just going to draw what you think this is all going to look like. So we're going to draw a graph of the resting membrane potential, then you're going to draw this idea of the threshold, and I realize I haven't talked about the threshold that much, okay? And you'll talk about that when you get to the actual potential lecture, but for now, the threshold is some, uh, some, um, uh, voltage, okay, that's a little bit above the resting membrane potential. And you, your stimulus has to be strong enough, okay, so again, the stimulus is touching the table, light hitting your eye, that kind of thing. The stimulus has to be strong enough to actually get above that threshold to get an action potential to fire. And then what I want you to do is I want you to think about this question. We sort of touched on it already, but I want you to try and think about it a little bit more deeply. If the neuron suddenly became very permeable, what does that word permeable mean? Holy, holy, okay. If it, it certain, cer certainly, if it suddenly allowed sodium to come into the cell, what would happen to the resting membrane potential? Okay, so get together with someone around you and just take two minutes to draw out what you think this would look like, and then we'll, we'll come back and we'll do it together. Okay. And I was just telling those folks back there that this is a this is a really hard idea. Okay, so if you're struggling with this, don't worry, you're not done. It's just that it's going to take a little time to to change your brain. Okay, it takes a little time for this to really yes, sink in. Even even for intro bias, this is one of those ideas that they really struggle with. Okay. Okay. So does anybody want to guess what what kind of line we should draw on here for our rest of our brain potential? A straight horizontal line. What about for the thresholds? Totally get. Okay, so that's a different line, but the threshold is just going to be another straight line, but it's just going to be a little bit above. Okay, and if you're confused about the threshold, just put that aside for a minute because that's something that really comes into play when you understand how the action potential works. Okay, so for now, just know that there is this thing called the threshold potential. This blue line is our resting potential. If you're just going along hunky dory, there's nothing coming in, no, no input, then your cell resting membrane potential looks like that. Okay? And this line, if we were to put a put a number on it, would be somewhere between negative 60 and negative 80 on average around negative 70. Okay? Okay. Is the threshold potential more positive or more negative than the resting potential? Positive. It's a little more positive, yeah. Okay? Now, if the neuron suddenly became very permeable, so you're kind of going along in time, and then something happens, okay, and the cell actually becomes permeable to sodium, what would our line look like? Go higher. It would increase. You got it exactly right. So it would do something along these lines, okay? This might be sort of bad drawing by freehand from PowerPoint, okay? So it, it would be going along at the resting potential, all of a sudden sodium is allowed to come in, and because we established that concentration gradient, uh, sodium wants to flow into the cell, right? And so that's what's going to happen. Sodium is a positively charged particle. It's going to come into the cell, and that's going to result in a big change in our resting potential. It's going to actually cause the potential to get more positive. It might get up to positive 50, positive 60, something like that. Okay? Yeah. If the channels remained open, would it kind of do like a peak and valley thing until it reached equilibrium? That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. So if you were to leave those sodium channels open, all of this stuff wouldn't work because what would end up happening is the sodium would go to equilibrium. We don't have our concentration gradient anymore. That's what happens when you die, basically. Okay? Not good. So instead, what you'll learn about when you do action potentials is that there's mechanisms that let that rise really fast, so the sodium gates open, but then they quickly Close, okay, and our resting potential is referred to normal really fast. We'll get into that again when we get into action potentials. Okay, so you guys feel somewhat comfortable with the idea of a resting potential and that it changes. That's the main takeaway message.
same kind of um, model of what is happening when that happens, right? We have sodium rushing in, very fancy category, um, coming in, and that's going to cause the inside of our cell to become more positive temporarily. Okay, it gets more positive temporarily, and then it goes back to the rest. Okay. Okay. So this is just to reinforce the fact that our action potential is going in one direction. Okay, it's going down our axon and it's got myelin around this whole axon, and when it gets to the end, oh, sorry, when it gets to the end, it's all kind of extra stuff, it's going to actually result in something happening in the synaptic terminal, okay? This is one other kind of note, is that um, multiple sclerosis is actually a disease in which all that myelin that's surrounding the axon starts to get eaten away by the body's own immune system, and so some of the <coughs> symptoms associated with multiple sclerosis is that you have uh, kind of system-wide uh, problems with speech, memory, movement, emotion, because you have uh, the signals getting crossed, essentially, between axons because they don't have that insulation layer. It's like getting a short in your wiring when the, the shielding on your wiring gets in. Okay? Yeah? Is there, like, medical um, signs that is made, like, synthetic um, mining? Uh, not that I know. No, not that I know. There are drugs that can slow the process down, but I have not heard of any way of actually replacing that myelin. That's that's one of the aims of stem cell therapy. Okay, but they are not quite there yet. There's a question. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. But did that thing happen if you're SE potential and you've got no potential to be too close? that's a question I haven't heard considered. Um I don't think that really would happen. And in fact, the resting potential will surpass the threshold potential. The threshold potential is just a, it's just kind of a, a magic line that when when the um, inside of the cell gets gets that positive, okay, because the threshold potential is a little bit more positive than the resting potential. So when it passes that line, that's kind of a magic line, magic line, okay, that actually will result in action potential firing. And I'm gonna leave that to a later lecture when you guys learn about action potentials for why that is. Okay? So you'll have to kind of take one day through it. Alright? Yeah. Um, so basically the straight line that we have is the resting potential okay. without the sodium channel. But with, when you open the sodium channels, that straight line disappears and that and you go up, you have a peak, yeah. and then you come back down. Okay, so if that line was the resting potential line. Well the resting potential is just the, the flat line okay. at rest, right? Okay. And then Let's say you have some stimulus that comes in and you touch the table, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's going to let some sodium in at the end of our dendrites. Mm -hmm. And if it's strong enough and enough sodium gets in, then we're going to get up to this big strong So what is that line measuring? It's, it's measuring the potential inside. We just don't call it the resting potential because now we're not at rest. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so what happens when the action potential actually gets to the end of the axon in the synaptic terminal? Well, there are couple of different things that can happen. So remember, an action potential is information, right? If I have touched the table hard enough, it's going to convey information in the form of an action potential to my brain that I am touching an object, right? Because the mechanoreceptors in the tips of my fingers have been disrupted enough to actually send the signal from, the, from my hand that's on the table to my brain. My brain will then take that input and decide what to do with it, okay? So, an action potential is information. So how do we actually transfer that information? There's not one single neuron that's going to actually uh, take this information from my fingertip to my brain. There's actually a number of, of neurons between my fingertips and my brain, okay? And so we have to actually take the information in the form of the action potential, and we have to get that information to the next cell. What's the next cell called in our mind? We have our presynaptic cell and our postsynaptic cell. Okay. So there are a couple of different ways that neurons can actually talk to each other or that neurons and other cells can talk to each other. There are these things called electrical synapses, okay? And if you're a biology student, you might be familiar with the term gap junction. If you're not a biology student, you can think of them as holes, okay? Holes in the postsynaptic cell, okay, so the one coming next after the synapse where um, we can just keep on passing that same action potential event to the next cell, okay? And you can really think of electrical synapses as the action potential, the same action potential just kind of 
continuing on to the dendrites of the next cell. Okay? What we're going to actually talk a little bit more about is this idea of a chemical synapse. And this can be neuron to neuron or it can be a neuron to another cell. And chemical synapses are where neurotransmitters are actually released. Okay? You already told me some of the neurotransmitters that you know. Um, and these neurotransmitters are released from these structures that are called synaptic vesicles, which is a fancy way of saying chemicals inside little fat balls. Okay? <laughs> so we have little, um, little balls uh, made out of plasma membrane, and they contain neurotransmitter. It kind of holds them until it's time for that neurotransmitter to be released or not. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Chemical synapses. So this is a figure that kind of shows us what that sort of might look like. So neurotransmitters are released from vesicles, that's what these little circles are, okay, into the synaptic cleft or the synaptic terminal, which is this part right in here in this space. Those chemicals, that neurotransmitter, can then go and bind to a protein or a receptor that is on the plasma membrane of the next cell. Okay, and that's what these little guys are. What's a receptor? When I use that term, a receptor, what is that? It is a protein, okay, but more specifically, what's the function of a receptor? Yeah, you can think of it as a gate. It's fine to the gate, and it's either going to cause the gate to open, or in some cases, it's going to cause the gate to stay closed, okay? There's a lot of different things that these neurotransmitters can actually do. Okay, so um, any questions about this so far? How are we doing? This is actually the picture I showed you earlier of the synaptic terminal. And all these little red circles are these little red circles in this figure. Okay? So in this figure, these are all full of neurotransmitters. Okay, so chemical synapses, so these postsynaptic synapses can either be what are called excitatory or they can be inhibitory. Okay, and this is going to get us to the basis of how drugs work and, and also eventually to, to learning. Okay, so excitatory are, um, they actually cause the postsynaptic cell, the resting potential of our postsynaptic cell, to become more positive. Okay, so instead of maybe being negative 70, they're actually going to cause the resting potential to increase to maybe negative 60 or negative 50. Okay, so they raise the membrane potential and they get it closer to the threshold, a little bit like what you were talking about earlier. Okay, so we raise our membrane potential temporarily and we get it a little bit closer to that threshold potential. The flip side of that would be a synapse where um, we have an inhibitory effect. Okay. And this is going to cause the postsynaptic cell resting potential to become more negative. So instead of negative 70, maybe we go to negative 80, or we go to negative 90, and we're getting further away from our threshold. Okay? And this also contributes to tons of complexity in the nervous system, because all these different synapses can be inhibitory, they can be excitatory, different neurotransmitters can have an inhibitory or an excitatory effect. Okay, so we're going to return to the graph that you made a little while ago, hopefully you broke down the graph, and we're going to ask ourselves this. If you were to take a drug that had an inhibitory effect on the postsynaptic neuron, what is going to happen to the resting membrane potential of that neuron? I kind of just told you this a little bit, but see if you can go ahead and draw that out in the graph. Okay, just take a moment, we won't spend too much time here. So, if you were to take a drug that had an inhibitory effect, what do you think the graph would look like of the resting memory potential now, compared to what we saw earlier? With the line, with the with the new line of the cell that has had this drug, would it be lower or higher than our previous resting memory potential? Lower. Lower. That's right. Okay. So now, when we treat the neuron with an inhibitory drug. Our resting membrane potential was previously here, but now it's actually going to be lower. Now, if we have to get to the threshold to fire an action potential, and action potentials are the way we get information around our body, our nervous system, 
is it going to be easier or harder for that neuron to actually acquire an action potential? It's going to be harder because we before we only had to go this distance. We only had to get a little bit more positive to acquire an action potential. But now we have to go from here all the way up to here to get to the threshold. Yeah. Is there anything that ever alters the threshold potential? That alters the threshold yeah. potential? Um, yes. But I'm not going to get into that right now. Yeah. <laughs> there are things that can, that can alter it. Uh, and, and actually, the threshold can be different between different neurons. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to get to that next. Um, how many of you uh, are over 21? Okay. So, when you, all of you that have only ever had alcohol that are over 21, <laughs> had an alcoholic drink, what does it do to you? Only. Who says more? Who says less? 
this totally confused me. No, I don't. <laughs> um, if you have a whole bunch of receptors for a neurotransmitter, then in general that means that you're going to be more sensitive to that neurotransmitter. Okay? And what that means is that you're going to be more likely to fire an action potential if you have more receptors. Okay? Do you think that the number of receptors in the neuron can change? And if so, over what time scales? What do you think? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm asking the question, probably it's going to change. Yeah, okay? <laughs> and this actually forms the whole basis for learning and memory, okay? This is a total trip, so just take this in. The amount of receptors that are in a synapse actually form the basis for this term that we call you don't have to write this down, but it's called long-term potentiation, okay? This is the fundamental basis for what we understand about, about learning and memory, okay? So very simply, this is a great figure I actually found earlier today that I have never seen before. These are all the neurotransmitters. They conveniently colored them red, as the rest of our figures have, right? And this is the end of our presynaptic neuron. This is the synapse, right, or the, the synaptic terminal. Um, on our postsynaptic neuron, we have three receptors for that neurotransmitter right now. Okay, that means that um, you have to, you know, you can actually get some neurotransmitter in here that's going to fire. But let's say this person is practicing a skill or a memory. Um, this is the we have the same amount of neurotransmitter. We release it. There's a lot more opportunities when we have more um, uh, receptors for that neurotransmitter to bind. Okay, there's not that many um, opportunities here, but there's lots of opportunities here. So we can actually have a lot of neurotransmitter come in. It can open up a whole bunch of channels for, say, sodium, for example, um, and actually cause an action potential to fire between this neuron and this neuron more easily than it did between this neuron and this neuron. So essentially what happens, this is a form of synaptic plasticity, okay? Synaptic plasticity. They can change their response to a stimuli by changing the number of receptors that are in a synaptic terminal for a given neurotransmitter, okay? So this is what is the basis for learning memory behavior. There's a lot of subtleties to this and a lot of other kinds of things that you're going to learn about in this class. So this is the very basic idea behind and this statement is important too. So neurons can change their response to stimuli based on their previous history. So what's going to cause the neuron to incorporate more receptors into the synaptic terminal? It's going to be what happens to that neuron last in the last second, in the last minute, in the last week, in the last month. Okay. So let's say you are learning a new task and you are firing a set of neurons to learn this new task. Okay. You're going to keep firing the same set of neurons. And over time, we can we want to know more about the biochemistry of this if you could, but over time, the postsynaptic neuron is going to incorporate more and more receptors for that neurotransmitter. And eventually, it's going to become more receptive to that neurotransmitter and it's going to lay down either a, you know, a memory or it's going to learn, we're going to learn something. It's going to make that pathway. Uh, fire more easily, okay? So, I don't know if we want to go through all of this, but this is uh, basically the last slide. Um, earlier you mentioned, uh, can you become, I don't know what the word you use, you said desensitized or something along yeah. the line. And I said it's habituation. So, um, if you've been like um, in a loud room, and over time, you're, you start to have a conversation, right? And you're talking, you and I are talking, but all these people are, are actually being really loud. You're going to focus in on the conversation and kind of start to ignore this background noise. That's actually something that happens in your brain um, that has to do with this idea of habituation, where you're actually going to um, zero in on, on the conversation. We're, we're able to tamp down in using some of these ideas that we've talked about today, some of these Unless someone says your name, cocktail. Yeah, that's another one. That's, I'm yeah. sure you guys will talk about things like this. Um, sensitization <laughs> is the opposite of that. You become sensitized to something, you're going to more readily fire that pathway. Um, it doesn't take as much stimulus to actually fire that set of neurons. And then I mentioned this idea of long term potentiation, and this is this repetitive stimulation. Okay? 
and that's going to actually alter how things are working in the synapse, how many um, receptors are in that synapse, and then uh, lead to learning and memory. Okay, so I kind of left you on a little bit of a clip, but I think that'll be good because you're going to end up talking about these same ideas in the next session. Yeah. Can you give us an example of sensitization? Um, have you ever had the experience where you'll get a, a feeling on your skin that all of a sudden is just really sensitive? Mm -hmm. um, this is maybe not a universal thing, but I think quite a few people have that. Um, for some reason, the nerves in that area get very sensitive. Sometimes if you've had um, a cast on and then you get the cast off, sometimes the neurons in your arm can feel really, um, you know, they just feel really sensitive. Anything that kind of touches you, you're kind of aware of it. Um, even clothing, right, can, can feel really even painful at times. Um, your neurons in that area, they, they get sensitized over time. We can talk a lot more about that in mind, but I think we're sort of wrapping up the end here. I think that was the last thing I have, so there you go.